Um, if we go back to this example that we did last week, and let me redraw it. This was 163 megahertz. We went from 75 megahertz, sorry, 75 ohms to, let's see, we went through a capacitor. This is one of the two solutions that we did. Went through an inductor to uh, 400 ohms. Right, and that problem we worked out uh, a match here, consisting of a capacitor which had a reactance of minus J one hundred and fifty six ohms, and an inductor which had a reactance of plus J one ninety two ohms. Again, I don't have to work through this in detail again because we've already done the problem, uh, but uh, that is what it is. Um, you, know, you might think about how this looks in terms of a Smith chart. Why not? All right, this should tell us something or give us some experience with this. What would be a logical choice for Z naught for such a thing? If we were to analyze this using the Smith chart, we know all impedances are normalized. What would be a logical choice for Z naught? Well, uh, again, any value will work, including by the way, complex impedances. But uh, normally if you're doing a matching problem, you're matching to some value and that value you're trying to match to would be the one that you'd select for Z naught. If I select Z naught to be 75 ohms, then I know that 75 ohms corresponds to the center of the Smith chart. And uh, that will allow me to use all the convenient features of the Smith chart. So normally you choose 75 ohms here. Um, I point this out because there are occasions where people standardize to 50 ohm reference impedances. I could work this entire problem out using 50 ohm reference impedance. Um, it would work fine, except uh, the center of the chart would not correspond to a match, right? So the chart would correspond to 50 ohms, not 75 ohms. I point that out simply because, for example, if you use an instrument which displays impedances in terms of Smith charts, that instrument may assume that Z naught's 50 ohms. So a very common problem to have in an RF lab, if you are not experienced, is to walk in test a circuit like this that's supposed to be matching to 75 ohms, and then wonder why you can't get to the center of the Smith chart. Well, because the center of the Smith chart was 50 ohms, not 75 ohms. Uh, some devices will let you pick one of these values. And there are other values that you might consider. So I'm just, just uh, warning you some pitfalls here. Right? If I look at the load impedance here, or the output impedance, it's supposed to be 400 ohms, I can Calculate this as a normalized impedance. That would be 400 ohms divided by 75 ohms, which is a normalized impedance of 5.33 plus J0, unitless. All right. So, in terms of Smith chart stuff, I think of this as being a normalized impedance 5.33 plus J0. And if I were to plot that on the Smith chart, there's my Smith chart. Well, let's see. The reactance is zero, so it's going to be somewhere along this line, this horizontal line, and 5.33, that's on this side. So 5.33 is going to be right about there. Right? If we go back to the actual chart, again, you see this is 5 right here. This is 10 right here. So 5.33 would be right about here. So that's where that would look on the Smith chart. We can go one step here to the left. And we could ask ourselves what this point would look like on the Smith chart, All right? Now, what do we have here? Uh, we have the parallel combination of these two things, right? This is 400 ohms in parallel with J192 ohms. I presume you can work that out by yourself and find that this is plus that 75 ohms J156 ohms. That's the actual impedance looking to the right there. The normalized impedance, of course, is this divided by 75 ohms. And we get that the normalized impedance looking to the right here is 1 plus J2. 1 plus J2. Where is that point? Well, again, let's test our understanding of how the geometry works here. Here's the unit circle. We know that the R equals one curve is this circle right here. That's R equals one. So it must be somewhere on this curve. 
And we know the x equal two curve, here's x equals one. So x equals two is gonna be something like this. So this impedance falls right about there. So we can think about the process of adding this inductor as being uh, the process of shifting this point up to this point, this location in the Smith chart. Questions about that? All right. Now we can go one more step. Now, this is a simple example, and that's good because this is a little bit dis could be disorienting if you're not used to it. But note that this this makes perfect sense, right? If I have 75 ohms plus J156 ohms looking to the right here, to cancel that, get back to 75 ohms, I need to introduce a reactance of minus J156 ohms, right? Um, and looking this way, then I have, of course, 75 ohms, right? Uh, normalized, that's 75 ohms divided by 75 ohms equals one plus J zero. No surprise there because that was the whole intent of the circuit was to land back at uh, 75 uh, ohms. But now the thing I wanna point out is how, what this means on the Smith chart. When we added this reactance, we did not change the real part of the impedance, right? We went from 75 ohms to 75 ohms. The value of R never varied from one. What varied was the reactive or the imaginary part. So what uh, an RF engineer would think of this as is the process of moving along this curve and then landing there. So this last step, adding this capacitor, that series capacitor was moving along this arc and ending up there, All right? So why, what's the, what's the appeal here? Well, you know, you can write a computer program to do this and they exist and we use them all the time. But oftentimes you don't get a feeling for what are the possibilities quickly by doing that. By understanding how these things look on the Smith chart, you can pretty quickly, and this is a very useful skill to have to speed things up, you can very quickly identify what possible combinations of capacitors and inductors are gonna work here, right? Um, yeah, I'll tell you, I am probably among the youngest of the remaining electrical engineers who remember a time when we had to use Smith charts. In other words, it used to be to do problems in RF, not so much these, but problems where you had transmission lines and all kinds of RF, complicated RF stuff. You had to use a diagram like this just to do the basic work because the computing just wasn't there. You couldn't do it on a calculator fast enough. Uh, if you look at those equations in the textbook section I gave you, you can imagine that doing very simple things like this could get really tedious on a calculator. And it was much faster to know how to do these calculations on a Smith chart. I'll tell you these days that is really not so important. Uh, that aspect of using the Smith chart to do the basic calculations uh, is less important than it used to be. The greater value of the Smith chart or the why it continues to be important is, has to do with these two things. One is the thing I just showed you here, which is it gives you insight into the possibilities. Once you understand possibilities, you can be a better designer, right? But there's another thing. And that other thing has to do with bandwidth. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, not just bandwidth, frequency response, right? So the idea here is we can also use the uh, Smith chart Uh, to understand changes in impedance with frequency, that is frequency response. Now, what do I mean here? You know, <laughs> this is narrow band design, right? When we designed this, we said the frequency will be 163 megahertz and we're trying to put uh, hit the bullseye at 163 megahertz. But in practice, uh, the signals that we're working with won't be exactly one the, at the design frequency. They might be cover span. You know, you know that this is a weather radio frequency. 
weather radio signals are tens of kilohertz wide. So we're covering a span of frequencies around this. So the, we're not gonna be exactly at the bullseye uh, over the entire bandwidth of a signal. In fact, if we're building a radio, we might be covering tens of megahertz. And there's no way that we're gonna state the bullseye from say 153 megahertz to 173 megahertz. So an issue of practical concern here is what does, how does change as a function of frequency? So once again, you know, you could do these charts where you do the real part of the impedance looking in and you do the imaginary part of the uh, impedance looking in as a function of frequency. But even those don't really tell you that much. They sure you can see how it's changing, but it doesn't tell you in a way that's quite as useful as what I'm about to show you. And that's simply to plot the impedance looking in as a function of frequency. We know that at 163 megahertz, if we were to set up a piece of test equipment uh, that shows its Smith charts, a uh, vector network analyzer, for example, we set up our vector network analyzer to tell us what the impedance is looking in here. It brings up a Smith chart display at 163 megahertz. We see a marker sitting right at the bullseye. We know we designed the circuit right. But typically then what we do next is say, okay, device, tell me what this looks like as a function of frequency. And then what we would see is probably something, in this case, I've worked it out, looks something like this. So it turns out that when we go, when we increase in frequency, we go in this direction and uh, 200 megahertz is right about here. So we would know that as we increase frequency to 200 megahertz, we land there. As we decrease frequency, say to 100 megahertz, we land there. So what you commonly see in data sheets, for example, for filters or data sheets for various kinds of amplifiers or other devices, you will see these arcs in, in shown. And so they'll show these Smith chart diagrams and <clears throat> they'll be labeled by frequency. So if this were a, a, a diagram and a data sheet that I was making for this circuit, you'd see this, you'd see 100 megahertz, 200 megahertz marker here, 163 megahertz marker here in this chart and this, uh, this thing here. And that would give you a very concise uh, picture of how this device is uh, changing with frequency so that you could then anticipate things. For example, like VSWR, right? You know that a ring that uh, VSWR is constant over circles surrounding the uh, bullseye here. So you could very quickly ascertain what the VSWR was here simply by how far away it is from the origin. And the display would typically be uh, calibrated with VSWR. In fact, if you look at this chart, there's a VSWR scale there. And you could put the scale up here and see how far away you were. Of course, a modern piece of test equipment would just show you these rings and um, that would tell you uh, how the VSWR is changing. And from that, you could figure out what the reflected power was, right? Uh, from that, you could work out other things that would affect how you might be designing the rest of the system, right? So I would say the two most common short answers to the question, what is the deal with the Smith chart? One is understanding how to do design in a graphical way, uh, not necessarily do the calculations like we used to, but simply to have insight into how different changes uh, are going to uh, affect our ability to do a match or not. And then secondly, to do frequency responses. Right? Um, I will tell you that you, know, you might redesign this, say, yeah, I want better bandwidth. You know, I don't like this bandwidth because VSWR degrades too quickly. Well, you could imagine doing another circuit. And I'll tell you that circuit might look something like this. It might have a uh, a curve that looks like that. And you'd look at that and say, well, look, um, you know, that doesn't hit the bullseye. On the other hand, it VSWR stays low over a longer uh, range of frequencies. And that would very quickly illustrate how much better or worse this thing is in that sense. So once again, uh, it provides useful characterization. <clears throat>